Thank you, everyone. You can be seated. I've known for, uh, Phil for 50 years, and so are you, and we still have hair. So that is an amazing feat. And I also know uh, Brother Maurice. I met Maurice um, 1993. I went to a, a Rodney Howard Brown conference in Lakeland, and somebody asked me if they would give, if, Maurice, if I could give Maurice a ride home to the hotel. And I said, sure. And in the car, Brother Maurice was a little nervous, and he said, you know, several, several months ago, I had a vision. And I told my pastor about it, and my pastor said, uh, don't tell anybody, uh, Maurice. But he said, I really feel like I should be telling you this vision. So he told me the vision, and he saw America, and he saw flames all over America. And then the Lord spoke to him and said, it's Babylon, it's Babylon. He says, does that mean anything to you? And I said, yes, it does. I happen to be writing a book right now called Babylon Rising. And that book is right, let me get that right now on this. That book is right there, published in 1999, sold over 12 copies worldwide. <laughs> and it's still, it's been flying off the shelf, but we discontinued. We sold one more last summer and we discontinued it and we replaced it with this one. The Hour That Changes Everything, number one bestseller on Amazon in Canada and the U.S. It's a book that has 265 pages and 258 footnotes. It was co-written by Wayne Hastings, who was one of the 75 authors uh, from Thomas Nelson, who published the New King James Bible. And when Wayne did five commentaries on the book of Revelation, word-by-word -word studies, he got done my book, and he said, Rick, I have never seen the dots joined like you just joined them. And he is convinced that the United States of America is in Bible prophecy. So I want to tell you something. When you get this book, this book is theologically rock solid. But it goes against traditional thinking. But it's rock solid theologically. There's a saying, uh, if you don't know where somebody's coming from, you don't know where they're going to. So I want to give you a brief background of who I am and where I've come from. When I was seven years old, I walked down the aisle of a Baptist church and I asked Jesus Christ into my heart. I was raised in a church of cessation theology. That says that miracles don't happen any day. And I live by the five cardinal rules. I don't drink, don't smoke, don't swear, don't chew, and don't you date a girl that do. And if I figured if I could just maintain three of those, I'm in. But by the time I was 18, I was kind of looking at maybe adding another two more. And I started searching for a university to go to. I went to Oral Roberts University. I saw it on television uh, with my cousin, Bill Pearson. And I learned at Oral Roberts University that God still does miracles. And he actually speaks to people today, right now. Oral Roberts was called to raise up your students to hear my voice go where my power is not known, my voice is heard small, and my light is dim. And that God still, I thought, what a concept. God does not change yesterday, today, and forever. And so we went to that university at 18 years old. And then we continued our journey. We went to Florida to Clearwater. And in an apartment in Florida, I decided I was going to make a vow to this God of Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, and Oral. And I said, if you're up there and you're real, if this thing is real, I will do anything you want me to. I will go into any jungle, but any place ever. But I have to know that you are real. When I released that vow, the door of the apartment blew open and a wind came into the room and encircled me. Both me and my cousin looked at each other and we buried our face in the carpet. I said the name Jesus, Jesus over and over again because I wondered what on earth have I conjured up? <laughs> and as I said the name Jesus over and over again, I started speaking in another language. And as I spoke in another language, a still small voice said to me, Son, you will share this experience with other people that do not believe in my power nor my existence. At that point, I said, God, I don't know what's going on, but please stop the wind. 
and the wind left the, the room and the door slammed behind it. I did not know that Ezekiel went up in a whirl, or not Ezekiel, but um, Elijah went up in a whirlwind. I didn't know that a, a whirlwind came and spoke to Jonah. I didn't know that Ezekiel had a whirlwind come down and God spoke to him. And I didn't know that on the day of Pentecost, and it came, they were gathered together with one accord, all the disciples, and suddenly there came a sound from heaven as a rushing mighty wind. It filled the room where they were at, and they began to speak in over 15 languages, the 15 dialects of, uh, of the people that were around there, praising God in other languages. I didn't know any of that was in the Bible. Excuse me, I've got a little technical problem here. From 73 to 77, I went to ORU. I graduated from ORU, and I wanted to be a pilot. I wanted to fly missionaries. And I wanted to do something in God's work. But that didn't work out. They wouldn't let me stay in the States, and I had to go back home and work for my father in a little town of 3,000 people at a job I didn't want to do. Don't ever tell God that you won't work for somebody, live in a certain town, and do a certain job. You'll spend the rest of your life doing that, okay? In 1986, a phone call rang. Nine years of working for my dad, the phone call rang, and they wanted me to come to, to ORU to see if I would be interested in being a regent. I went to ORU uh, in Tulsa, Oklahoma, and I sat there on a board of people who had, were giving their lives to God. They were full-time ministry. And here I was sweeping out buses for my dad, making money, and I wasn't even tithing. And the Bible says in Malachi 3.10, Will a man rob God? You have robbed me in tithes and offerings. And I said, Lord, I am sorry. So I took 10% of my net worth and I gave it to medical missions and when I did that, something happened to me. Something supernatural happened, just like Cornelius in Acts chapter 10. When Cornelius, an angel came to him and said, Your tithes and offerings have come up for a memorial, Cornelius. Go to Peter and he'll show you the, the way to salvation. The first Gentile that ever got saved was visited by an angel. The same thing happened to me for a period of seven days. As I released that money, I had words flowing through my mind all for a full week, sentences, and I could not get them out, and it was all about the United States of America in Bible prophecy. It was to the point where I thought I was losing my mind until on the seventh night of the seventh day, an audible voice woke me up, called me by name, and I said, why are you calling me, Lord? And he said, because I love you, Rick, and I want you to have fruit that remaineth. John 15, 16 says, you've not chosen me, but I've chosen you and ordained you that you should go and bring forth fruit and that your fruit should remain. I was so rattled by this experience from what I saw coming that I slept for three weeks with my Bible on my chest and I begged God, please don't let me lose my mind. Something's really wrong with me. And I jumped on a plane and I flew to Tulsa, Oklahoma, and I asked Oral Roberts to personally come and lay his hands on me. Bob DeWeese, somebody said, what do you think's wrong? I said, a lot. So Brother Roberts graciously met with me. He laid his hands on me. I shared briefly with him what happened in the apartment in Clearwater. He laid his hands on me. I started to shake, and he started to laugh. And I was offended, and I said, and I looked at him and he said, no, 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 Rick, I'm not laughing at you. He said, you have heard from God. You're very close to your calling. You're very close to your calling right now. And I said, Brother Roberts, I'm afraid I'm going to lose my mind. And he said, you are not going to lose your mind. We're going to put you on this board and you're going to have a covering. And for the next 21 years, I sat on the board of regents, on the executive board of seven men to run Oral Roberts University. 
Now, I, could, I would go back home to my small town and I would teach what I felt God had shown me. And what tonight you're going to learn is 35 years of studying. I live in a small town. I moved from my one little town of 3,000 people where I didn't want to live, Tilbury, and I moved to a place called Brantford. Brantford has a population of 100,000, and I had Bible studies and taught at church. I drew crowds as many as five and six people to my Bible studies. <laughs> In 2008, uh, I decided I got out of the business. We sold our business, and I was going into retirement, and I flew down to Tulsa, Oklahoma, and I, and I went to Oral Roberts' house, and I told Brother Roberts, I sold my business. I'm going into retirement. He said, Rick, why are you doing that? You're right in your prime. And I said, Brother Roberts, I think that season's over in my life. And Brother Roberts went like this, and he said, Now listen to me, Rick. Don't you get ahead of God. He will open a door for you, and when it opens, you will know. And sometimes it'll be easy, and sometimes it'll be hard. But you're going to have to decide to walk through that door said, okay, Brother Roberts, thank you very much. Brother Roberts died about six months after that. In 2015, I received an honorary doctorate of laws degrees from Canada Christian College for my years of volunteer work on boards and missions and churches. In 2017, they called me up and said, hey, Rick, we're going to Israel, and we want you to come. And I listened to the invitation. I thought, I've been to Israel four times. I've been baptized four times in the Jordan River. I think I'm in. I don't want to go to it, but thank you so much. And three days later, the Lord said, go to Israel. I said, okay. I called them back. Okay, I'm going to go to Israel. I was in Israel, and we toured. It was a great tour, but I met a man in Israel in a swimming pool, Dr. Rod Hembray from Bible Discovery TV, and I, we, we were talking about prophecy, and of course, I start bloviating. I can go forever about prophecy. And he listened to me, and he says, you know, my dad used to talk like this. Now, now Rod Hembray had been on television for 30 years with his father. They came from the Rex Humbard ministry. And Rod and I were in the swimming pool, and Rod took off and swam down in the deep end. And he said the Lord spoke to him and said, Rod, I want you to build Rick a TV studio. I want you to give them your staff. I want you to give them your cameras. I want you to give them all your expertise. I want him to write a show, and I want him to produce it, and I want you to do everything for free. <laughs> so Rod called me about three weeks later, and he told me this. And I thought, well, the price is right. <clears throat> But do I want to go on national television and teach this? And I remember Brother Robert saying, sometimes it's easy, Rick, and sometimes it's hard. And then I remembered my vow in the apartment, and I said, I'm in. And that was three years ago, on March of 2019, we began our show. Three weeks before our show began, Dr. Jack Van Empe died. And NRB gave me his spot. So I went from a Bible study to national television on NRB and across the nation. We're on about 120 stations now. And I begin my show every week with, uh, Hi, this is Rick Pearson. Or my name is Rick Pearson. This is Prophecy USA, a program specifically designed to unveil the hidden mystery of America's role in Bible prophecy. And this meeting tonight is a meeting specifically designed to unveil your role in Bible prophecy. Gene Bailey of Flashpoint said to me, um, you're a guy from Canada. What, what are you doing with a TV show called Prophecy USA? And I said, Gene, if God calls you to go to Nineveh, don't go to Tarshish. <laughs> because you might end up on a three-day Mediterranean all-you-can-eat cruise. So I am being obedient to the best of my ability. The purpose of prophecy, the purpose of prophecy is for God to keep his promises to his children, and those promises are already written in Scripture. Amos said, surely the Lord will do nothing except he reveal his secrets unto his servants, the prophets. 
Moses said the secret things belong to the Lord, but the things he revealed unto us belong to us and to our children forever that we may do all the words of the law. Who are his children? John 16, 13 says, When he, the spirit of truth, has come, he will guide you into all truth, and he will show you things to come. For my sheep hear my voice, and they follow me. And if you love me, you will keep my commandments. Prophecy is a done deal. Remember, the purpose of prophecy is to keep his promises to his children, and those promises are already written in Scripture. Isaiah prophesied, I am God, and there's none like me, declaring the end from the beginning and from the ancient of times, the things that are not yet done. I will do my pleasure, for I have spoken it, and I will bring it to pass. I have purposed it, and I will do it. Jeremiah 1.9 says, I'm watching over my word to perform it. You notice he's not watching over my word and my vision and my dream or your word and your vision and your dream. He's watching over his word. Never, never, never base your theology on somebody else's vision, dream, or word. Now, why is that? Because Paul said in 1 Corinthians 3, 9, whether there be prophecies, they shall fail for we know in part and we prophesy in part. Don't believe every spirit, but test the spirits whether they be of God. Moses wrote, how shall we know the word which the Lord has spoken? When a prophet speaks in the name of the Lord, if the thing follow not nor come to pass, that is the thing which the Lord hath not spoken, but the prophet has spoken it presumptuously, and thou shalt not be afraid of him. Galatians says, if a man thinks himself to be something when he's nothing, he deceives himself. But let every man prove his own work, and then he shall have rejoicing in himself and not in another. R.W. Shambrock said, some are sent and some just went. God warns there will be prophesiers and prophet liars. But we are admonished to despise not prophecy. God speaks through imperfect vessels. Do you know why that is? Because he has no other choice. <laughs> Think about that. The prophets aren't perfect, and neither are you. So there's three things that we have to remember. There is a God, I'm not him, and neither are you. <laughs> he has spoken it, he will do it, he has purposed it, and he will bring it to pass. So today we're not going to hear my rhema word. We're going to unveil the secret things already spoken in God's written word. Through the prophets of Moses' law, Isaiah's vision, Jeremiah's word, Daniel's dream, Ezekiel's prophecies, and John's revelation. God does not need anyone's permission, approval, nor our endorsements to fulfill his word. He has spoken it, he will do it, he has purposed it, he will bring it to pass. And his thoughts are higher than our thoughts. His ways are higher than our ways. And at the end of this evening, my prayer is that you, like my friend Wayne, who helped me write this book, will discover the hidden mystery of America's role in Bible prophecy. God does not necessarily tell us what we want to hear, he only says what he wants to say. His thoughts are higher than our thoughts. So let's begin our journey tonight. We're going to start with some traditional prophecy teaching. With Daniel's interpretation of King Nebuchadnezzar's dream in 600 B.C. We're now looking at traditional prophecy and everyone that teaches prophecy agrees with this. God removes kings and he sets up kings. He gives wisdom to the wise and he revealeth the deep and secret things. Nebuchadnezzar had a dream concerning the providential nations that were going to rise and fall in history. In that dream, in Daniel chapter 2, 
He had an image of a man, and Daniel interpreted that dream as a prophetic foretelling of six providential nations that would rise and fall in the future. He saw this image, a head of gold, which represented Babylon, a breast of silver, which represented Persia, thighs of brass, which represented Greece, legs of iron, which re represented East and West Rome, and a kingdom made of all the above by the ten toes. Now, this is traditional prophecy teaching. Every prophecy teacher teaches this. Forty years after, 40 years after that vision or that dream, Daniel has his own vision. In this vision, he sees animals, and the animals represent the same kingdoms that Nebuchadnezzar had. He sees a lion with wings, which represented Babylon of 600 B.C. He saw a bear with three ribs in its mouth, representing Persia, which conquered Lydia, Egypt, and Babylon. Those are the three bones in its mouth. He saw a leopard with four heads and four wings, which represented Greece, which deposed Persia. And, those, and, and Greece was divided into four regions after the, the king died, and four generals divided the land into four regions. And that's what the four heads mean according to traditional prophecy. He saw Greece with uh, four heads and four wings. I'm sorry, he saw, he saw a beast uh, at, the, at the bottom of the, uh, the diagram. The beast represented Rome, but then sometime in the future, all of those nations would come together and form a ten-nation conglomerate in, at the very end of, of the days, a ten-nation conglomerate called the New World Order. Now, In Revelation 13, John sees a beast and she rises from the sea of humanity. It's made up of the same animal nations described by Daniel. The lion of Babylon, the bear of Persia, the four-headed leopard of, of Greece, the beast of Rome with the ten horns on its head. And John, 600 years after... Daniel sees all the same animals rising from the sea of humanity. In Revelation 17, John has his final vision. This is the final vision that John has of the beast. But there's a woman on the beast... And this woman is named Mystery Babylon the Great. And that woman has traditionally been interpreted as occurring during the tribulation. The woman rides the beast throughout the tribulation period. This is traditional theology. This woman represents religious immorality and she rides that beast all through the tribulation period. This is where Prophecy USA turns a corner from traditional prophecy. So what exactly is the tribulation? In the book of Revelation, it foretells the future of the last of the last days. Jesus said, for then shall come great tribulation, such as was not since the beginning of the world to this time, no, nor ever shall be. We have never yet entered into the tribulation. We have had personal tribulation. The world has gone through some tribulation, but we have never had the tribulation that Jesus described. Now, the book of Revelation is divided into several parts. Chapters 2 and 3, Jesus warns the believers before the tribulation comes. He warns them. He says to the church of Ephesus, you've lost your first love. He says to Sardis, you're full of dead works. He says to Smyrna, you're going to be persecuted. 
Pergamos and Thyatira have sexual immorality, and Laodicea has a problem with their money. So he warns the churches, and every, we will see in about 15 minutes, all of those churches are here right now. But from chapter 6 through 16, this is where the tribulation is. The tribulation begins, Jesus opens the seven seals. And then the tribulation begins. There's four riders of the apocalypse that begin the tribulation. They've not been released yet, but we will show you later what's coming. There's a one world government, the beast, that is given power to rule during that tribulation period. There are seven seals, seven trumpets, and seven bowls of plagues released throughout that time. They have not been released yet. One third of all vegetation, one third of fresh water, and one third of the sea gives forth the dead. One third of mankind, mankind dies during the tribulation. There's 7.8 billion people on the earth. 2.2 billion people are going to die in a period of seven years according to Bible prophecy. That is 300 million people a year, which is the, almost the population of the United States of America every year is going to die through all the calamities that are coming. There will be pestilence, the, the sun will scorch men, there will be an asteroid called Wormwood. You do not want to be here for the tribulation. And as far as me and my wife are concerned, we have studied this and we are voting pre-trib rapture all the way. Okay? And I am a pre-trib rapture for anyone that's post-trib, there's the door. I don't want to talk to you. I get in arguments with people and I have finally just said, listen. I agree with you. You are going to go through the tribulation. <laughs> you are going to go through the tribulation because just like, just like the, the ten spies, only jo Joshua and Caleb got to go into the promised land because they believed that God was able to deliver them. And we believe that our God is able to deliver us. Okay? In chapter 17, 18, and 19 is John's last vision. John's last vision, a woman appears. When does she appear? Who is she? Where is she? And why is she? Who is this woman? That has been the greatest controversy for the last 2,000 years in Bible prophecy. But there are four time sequences hidden in scripture that will challenge every traditional teaching proposing that the woman rides the beast through the tribulation. Jesus said to the scribes and Pharisees, your traditions have made the word of God of none effect. Harper's Bible Dictionary says that word effect is kairos. It means an appointed time in the purposes of God. None effect means you're missing the appointed time and the purposes of God. Think about that. In Jesus' day, the most studied Bible scholars of the day who studied the book didn't even recognize the author. But the common fishermen, tax collectors, housewives, and even the children were given revelation knowledge of who he was. He's the one. They could see it. Think about that. Habakkuk 2.3 says, Write the vision and make it plain upon tables that he may run that readeth it, for the vision waits for an appointed time. That word run denotes the struggle of a person of faith who has to stay the course against evil and remain committed to God. We will run the race and finish the course. But first, we have to unveil specific time sequences or secrets that have been hidden in Scripture for the last 2,000 years. And we will see who, when, where, and why this woman exists. The first time sequence we're going to look at 
is found right at the end of the tribulation. It's, remember, the tribulation goes from Re Revelation 6 through 16. Revelation 16, 17, the angels have poured out the seven seals, the seven trumpets, and the seven bowls upon the world. Now, in, verse six, in, in, in chapter 16, verse 17, it says, it is done. What's done? The tribulation is done. There's a global earthquake that takes place like none since the beginning of man, shakes the world. The city of Jerusalem is divided into three parts and the second coming of Jesus Christ takes place. But in Revelation 16, 19, after it says it is done, it says, and God remembered Babylon the great to make her drain the cup of the fury of his wrath. Now that word God remembered Babylon the great is the word mimneskami. It means to recall from memory or in other words, it's a past tense event. The wrath coming out of Babylon's cup upon the rest of the world is the last drop of his wrath. It's the last drop that's being poured out. So if that's the last drop of his wrath, where does the first drop of his wrath come from? How many here are following? You following along with me? So now we're going to look for the second time sequence that pinpoints where this woman is. Revelation 17, 1, it says, And one of the angels, not the seventh angel that had the seventh vial, but one of the seven angels who had the seven vials and already poured it out, came unto John, and said, come and I will show you the judgment of this great woman, this great prostitute. Why is he taking John somewhere else to see the judgment of the mystery woman if it just happened several seconds ago? He's taking John out of that time sequence from behind the tribulation. He says, come with me and I'm going to show you the judgment of this woman. Revelation 17.3 Got a little computer problem here and I don't know what's going on. He carried John away into the wilderness into another time sequence. And that is the second time sequence. Now we go to the third time sequence. From Revelation 17, 1 through 9, they describe this woman. Now remember, we're not at the end of the tribulation. He says, come with me, I'm going to show you something. And from Revelation 17, 1 through 9, he describes this woman. She's rich, opulent, a world leader. And then in verse 10, the angel gives us a time sequence where John is in the Bible. L let me explain that. Revelation 17, 7 says, And the angel came unto me, wherefore didst thou marvel? I will tell thee the mystery of the woman. And he's going to unravel the mystery of where this woman sits in Bible prophecy. There we go. Now my, my laptop's working. It froze up on me. Apologize for that. And the angel said unto me, Wherefore, wherefore didst thou marvel? I will show you the mystery of the woman. Now remember, the book of Daniel said that the books were sealed until the time of the end. But at the time of the end, the wise will understand and the wicked will not. No generation has ever had this teaching before, what you're listening to. The third time sequence is found in Revelation 17.10. And it says, here is the mind that hath wisdom. Now, this is going to be a little, a little confusing, but, but just stay with me. And there are seven kings... Just described the woman, described how rich and opulent she is. Now they come to Revelation 17, 10. There are seven kings, five have fallen, one is, and the other is not yet come. And the beast is the eighth. What? <laughs> now when, when you read that, 
There are seven kings, five have fallen, one is, and the other is not yet come, but the beast is the eighth and is of the seven. Now, a picture says a thousand words. Watch this. He comes to John and he says, five kingdoms have fallen. Egypt, Assyria, Babylon, Medio Persia, and Greece had already fallen. John is living in Rome. He says, one is. That is Rome. So now we have six kingdoms. But the beast is the eighth. If the beast is the eighth, who is the seventh? Is it possible it's the woman who's riding on the beast before the tribulation begins? Are you following me? So number one, Revelation 16, 19, the end of the the tribulation says it is done. Number two, the angel says, come with me, John, and he's taken away out of that time sequence. And number three, there are eight providential nations in history and the beast is the eighth. We have one time sequence left that will solidify all these others. 17, 1 through 11, the beast is described, but in Revelation 17, 12 says, And the ten horns which you saw, are ten kings, these are the horns that form the new world order, which have received no kingdom as yet, but receive power as kings one hour with the beast. The beast is not in power when the woman appears. The tribulation hasn't started yet. But she's sitting on the beast... And he's trying to rise up, but she's sitting on him. And it's going to take one hour for the beast to take over. And the ten horns which thou sawest are ten kings which have received no power as yet, but will receive power as kings one hour with the beast. In one hour, things will change. It will take one hour for Bible prophecy to be fulfilled. So now here we have John's final vision. It's now confirmed. We're seeing a picture of the beast before he comes into power. The seven heads of the beast are seven mountains or continents coming up from the waters, but there are also seven kingdoms. The ten horns that you see are ten divisions or ten regions that have not yet come together to rule the world. All of those animals have come and gone, but they're going to all join together and form a ten nation or a ten regional area around the earth. And they will be formed from the seven kingdoms who've been raised up through history. So Egypt, Assyria, Babylon, Persia, Greece, Rome representing the ethnic diversification of peoples, nations, multitudes, and tongues. Because that's exactly what the water represents, is peoples, nations, tongues, and peoples, nations, multitudes, and tongues. That's what the Bible says the water is. She rises up from the sea of humanity. So who is the woman sitting on this seven-headed beast? says the woman sits on the beast. That word sit is kathamia. And that means to rule over or please over. It's the same word used when Jesus sits on the throne and rules and reigns. This woman is ruling over the beast before he comes into power. In other words, she's holding him back from coming into power. And here is the mind that has wisdom in Revelation 17, 9. The seven heads are seven mountains on which the woman sitteth. Now, on page 45 of our book, we explain that this word used, seven mountains, is the word oros. 
It's used in Luke 3, 5 and 23, 30, and it differentiates mountains and hills. Hills is buonos. She is sitting on oros, mountains. The woman does not sit on seven hills. She sits on seven mountains. And Harper's Dictionary says oros is a high landmass projecting above the surrounding areas. The mountains come out of the waters, which represent peoples, multitudes, nations, and tongues. In Revelation 18, 17, it describes the woman, and it says, what city is like unto this great city, this woman? They use the word polis in Greek, where we get the word politicians and politics from. Harper's Bible Dictionary describes city as a population center denoted in scripture as having walls around her to protect her citizens. This is what a city was back then. But cities today do not have walls. But we do have population centers with air defense identification zones protecting the large population centers of people within them. And they're called countries in our modern vernacular. This woman is not sitting on a little city of seven hills. She's sitting on the seven continents of the earth, policing over peoples, multitudes, nations, and tongues. She is a city as, she's not a city as we know it. She is a country with global power policing over the beast before he comes into power. In the modern vernacular, this is how we should read Revelation 18, 17. So what country is like unto this great country, this woman? We have to look for a country that matches what that woman looks like. Number one, according to Jeremiah... She's been created by divine proclamation as prophesied by the major prophets in Scripture, Isaiah, Jeremiah, Ezekiel, and John. Jeremiah 51 says that she is a golden cup in the hand of the Lord. Providential means created from divine inspiration or divine proclamation. She was talked about way back before she was ever created just like the other providential nations that Daniel saw and Nebuchadnezzar saw. Now, there's 53 descriptions of this woman of this country, and we're going to go through and we're going to see what happens in this country. Number one, she has to be a providential nation. She has to be because she's already spoken of. The Bible says that she's a mystery. Mystery Babylon the Great, the mother of harlots. Remember, Daniel said the words are closed until the time of the end. None of the wicked will understand this, but the wise will understand. Those who hear my sheep hear my voice. If we're in the last days, like everyone says we are, should we not know who the seventh nation is? And how did God reveal it in the past? He used Isaiah, Jeremiah, Ezekiel, Daniel, John. He used angels, audible voices, and they were all touched by that angel or equipped to deliver a sure word of prophecy. For 2,000 years, prophecy teachers have speculated who this woman is. Some say that she's the Catholic Church. Some say that she sits in, this, uh, in a, a city of seven hills in Rome. I was listening to a, a prophecy teacher in Madison Square Gardens, it was packed, and I like this guy. He said, Babylon, this city is going to be built by the Antichrist during the tribulation period, and she will be full of every kind of sin you can imagine. Really? Where do you find that in Scripture? It doesn't say that the Antichrist builds Babylon. It doesn't say that at all. In fact, we're going to find out the first thing Antichrist does when he comes into power, he destroys Babylon. He takes the woman off his back. We will show that quickly here. Now, she symbolized globally as a woman. 
So he carried me away in the spirit in the wilderness, and I saw a woman sit upon the scarlet beast. Isaiah 47, 5 says, Sit thou silent, get thee into darkness, for thou shalt no more be called the lady of kingdoms. All of the other providential nations are recognized as animals. But this providential nation is recognized as a woman. The world recognizes America by her global icon, Lady Liberty. And in building her and the seven spikes protruding out of her head represent her illumination of liberty to the seven continents or seven mountains of the earth. Now here's where we shift gears from traditional prophecy. She was originally designed to be put in the Suez Canal representing the goddess Ishtar, but that didn't work out. So they brought her over here and made her Lady Liberty. This nation, this country that we're looking for, is the wealthiest of all nations. And the woman was arrayed in purple, scarlet, and colored, decked in gold, precious stones. Having a cup in her hand full of abominations and the filthiness of her fornication. And the merchants of the earth are waxed rich through the abundance of her delicacies. We have to look for the richest nation in the world before the Antichrist and his ten-horned final new world order come into power. We have to look for a rich nation that's represented like a woman. The world's uh, GDP is $50 trillion, and the USA GDP is $21 trillion. $21 trillion. The world population is 7.8 billion people. 350 million people in America represent 40% of the world's gross domestic product. The population of America, 5% of the world's population consumes 40% of the product, gross national product, gross domestic product. We are the richest nation in the history of mankind, the United States of America. And the Bible says in Revelation 18.3, excuse me, uh, 18, 12, 13, that she sells over 27 products. Now, every product you see on that screen is either built, grown, shipped in or shipped out or traded on the world's largest stock market in New York City. Every product that you see there. Meanwhile, the Statue of Liberty representing the Lady of Kingdoms, watches over the shipmasters literally passing by Babylon, New York. How many of these products does Rome trade? Or a city that's going to be built somewhere in the Mideast? This verse is already being fulfilled right now in real time. This isn't something that's going to happen. This is happening right now. We are already at the Kairos moment. The vision is not waiting for its appointed time. The appointed time is already being fulfilled right now under our noses. So where are the prophets who are telling us this? She's traded in slavery, according to Revelation 18, 13. 700,000, both black and whites, stopped slavery in this nation because President Abraham Lincoln decided they would not have this evil practice done in this city on a hill. In 1863, the Emancipation Proclamation was signed. But there was a book written during that time. It's called Behind the Scenes in the Lincoln White House. We find Lincoln was empowered as he studied and pondered the Bible, which played a critical role in the life, especially during the catastrophic Civil War. He was a ruler of a mighty nation going to the pages of the Bible with simple Christian earnestness, comfort and courage, and finding both in the darkest hour of a nation's calamity. Ponder it, 
O ye scoffers of God's holy word, and then hang your heads in shame. Christianity ended slavery. Not the secular humanist agenda of Stalin, Mao, Hitler, and President Xi Jinping, and Marxism in America is fighting these truths. That's why they should call themselves critical rage theorists, not critical race theorists. Because it's ridiculous to accuse Bible thumpers as being white supremacist, narrow-minded, homophobic bigots who have a war on women. That is totally ridiculous. It's ridiculous. Now, in my book, At the End of This Darkness, I explain the 13th Amendment was signed and the Emancipation Proclamation banned slavery in the U.S. Constitution. But on 92, in this book, I explain, despite this fact, human sex trafficking in the U.S. has hit record numbers. Slavery, while it may look different today, is unfortunately still alive and well in America. Each year, an estimated 14,000 to 17,000 foreign nationals are trafficked in the United States. The number of U.S. citizens trafficked within the country each year is even higher, with an estimated 200,000 American children at risk for trafficking in the sex industry. And this statistic does not include the 2 million illegal aliens allowed entrance in 2021 by the Biden administration and the thousands of innocent children who are being trafficked right now today in the human trafficking industry. So slavery is still here, unfortunately, but it's not the Christians that are doing it. This woman makes the merchants of the earth rich through the abundance of her delicacies. Almost every nation in the world trades with the U.S. She has a world currency. Wherein you were made rich, wherein were made rich all that had ships in the sea by reason of her costliness. And the woman which thou sawest is that great population center which reigneth over the kings of the earth. The word reigneth is not to be confused with an actual kingdom but rather the right or authority to rule over a kingdom. The U.S. rules the world with her currency. That's how we rule. Since World War II, the U.S. dollar has been the world currency around the world. But how did she get such great wealth? How did the U.S. get such great wealth? It's because she's a covenant nation. And a covenant with God initiated divine provision, guidance, and protection. Now, covenant is a binding agreement between two parties. A biblical covenant is a conditional promise made between God and man. On November 11, 1620, 102 pilgrims landed on Plymouth Rock and officially, knowingly or unknowingly, made a covenant with God. And this is what they said. Having undertaken the glory of God and advancements of the Christian faith and the honor of the king and country in the presence of God and one another, we covenant and combine ourselves together in a civil body politic. They claimed the land of America as a covenant with God. And when you have a covenant with God, you get covenant Protection. You get covenant provision, you get covenant guidance, you get covenant protection. And you, and you, and you, and you can all have your own personal covenant with God. I found that out when I released 10% of my net worth and I came back into covenant with God, just like Cornelius did. Now what happens when you form a covenant with God? If you observe and do all these commandments, which I command thee this day, that the Lord thy God give thee, this is in uh, Deuteronomy 28, 1 through 14, these blessings shall come upon you in the city, in the field, the fruit of thy body, the fruit of thy ground, the fruit of your cattle, the flocks, the sheep, the basket, the store. When thou comest in, you should be blessed coming in and blessed going out. Thine enemies that rise up against you shall be smitten by thy face. And they will flee from you seven ways. 
The Lord shall command the blessing upon thee in thy storehouse and in all that thou settest thine hand to do. And the Lord shall make thee plenteous in goods, in the fruit of thy body, the fruit of the cattle, the fruit of the ground, in the land which the Lord thy God has given thee. And the Lord will make you the head and not the tail, above only, and thou shalt not be beneath. And thou shalt not go aside from any of the words which I command thee this day, to the right hand or to the left, or to go after other gods to serve them. That's why the U.S. is so rich today. Because they took that Mayflower Covenant as the founding charter and they wove that into the Constitution and the Pledge of Allegiance. On her money, it says, In God we trust. And her Pledge of Allegiance says, One nation under God. The first president, George Washington, said this, It is the duty of all nations to acknowledge the providence of Almighty God to obey His will, to be grateful for His benefits, and humbly implore His protection and favor. There are 20 quotes I can give you, but we don't have time. At the, at the head of the Supreme Court, we've established our laws under God's divine moral protocol. Here we see Moses. And in 1844, this is what the Supreme Court said. Why may not the Bible, and especially the New Testament, without note or comment, be read and taught as a divine revelation in schools? Its general precepts expounded, its evidences explained, and its glorious principles of moral morality inculcated. Where can the purest principles of morality be learned so clearly or so perfectly as from the New Testament? That's what your laws were based on. The United States is a covenant nation. She's a providential nation. And what about that wealth? She took that wealth and she created the greatest military in the world. And the woman which thou sawest is that great city with reigneth over the kings of the world. That word reigneth is basilia. It means to rule over as a king. She's ruled the nations. In 2019, the United States spent 700 billion U.S. dollars on its military. That's roughly the size of the next seven largest military budgets in the world. 800 military bases in more than 70 countries and territories all over the world. America invests more on national defense than China, India, Russia, Saudi Arabia, France, Germany, United Kingdom, Japan, South Korea, and Brazil combined. America's Air Force boasts of 13,000 military aircraft compared to China and Russia. The world's next largest aerial powers have a total of only two to 3,000 military aircraft. The U.S. does not have the largest Navy. China does now. I just want to clarify that.